Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Midday Live here on TV3. My name is Pa Kwesiasari. We're coming to live from our news hub here at Kanda in Accra. Coming up in the next 60 minutes. Tension at Oprah Square as shops belonging to foreigners reopen. Electrical Dealers Association threatened to demonstrate. Also this hour, pressure mounts on the sports ministry to justify its spending at the just-ended Africa Cup of Nations. And elsewhere on the international front, new Prime Minister due to make statements to House of Commons after addressing his new cabinet ministers for first time. Also, Tunisian president is dead. Got details of all these stories plus many more coming up in the next 60 minutes. A reminder that we're streaming live on Facebook. You can also join us with your views, comments, and suggestions on any of our top stories this hour. Visit any of our social media pages on Facebook and Twitter. Our handle is TV3GH. Now, the Ghana Union of Traders Association has served notice that it will take to the streets in large numbers should government fail to enforce laws that forbid foreigners from undertaking retail business. Speaking at a press conference at the Opera Square Accra, the president of the association, Dr. Joseph Obain, said they will pour out in their numbers on the streets should government not meet their demands. <laughs> The Ghana Union of Traders Association, Guta, has responded to recent uneasy calm at Oprah Square in Accra, where some Ghanaian traders closed down shops belonging to foreigners. The president of Guta, Dr. Joseph Obing, recommended that over 100 shops that were closed down be opened while they arrive at a concrete solution. He added that their problem is not with the foreign traders, but with the laws that are not being enforced. We do not hate any foreigner, as we only show them respect and love. We only detest the fact that the laws are not being enforced. Some traders, however, expressed discontent at Guter's decision. We are not in support of if they insist on opening the shops for them, we will, will open, we will open their shops and, and close, close their, their shops. shops. Yes. We will close our, our leaders. Their we will close their shops. President of the Ghana Electrical Dealers Association, Geda, hinted that they will close down shops belonging to the foreigners if the leaders of Guta fail to live up to their promise after two months. Uh, two months is not too long. Two months is not long. Even if it is one year, it will come. But it is a matter to understand that after two months, if we do not hear anything, we will close the shops again. President of the Nigerian Union Traders Association, Chukwemeka Levi Nanji, also called on government for amendment of the Ghana Investment Promotion Law Act 865, which frowns on foreigners engaging in retail business. The leaders should start working now. The leaders should start working now. They should teach the people what is real, that these people have the right just as they do. The shops belonging to foreigners are expected to be opened. Meanwhile, some Nigerian retailers in Koforidia have appealed to government to resolve the retail impasse in some regions of the country to avoid xenophobic attacks in the future. They acknowledged and joined a peaceful retail business in the eastern regional capital, Koforidia, but one that replicated across the country. Here's a report by Yvonne Nikwe. The Nigerian retailers in Kofodia expressed a worry at pockets of retail trade disagreements in other regions of the country. They think their existence in the retail business should not be a threat to Ghanaian citizens as long as they pay taxes and have legal documents. We are having a peaceful business, so it may be they are about to come, we don't know, but for now we have not had such a button here in Kofodia. So they should just have some uh, mutual understanding so that the peace will still continue. We are enjoying their, 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 the way they accommodated us here. 
So we not want a situation whereby small thing will bring an, a, a problem that will generate a, a, a xenophobic attack. Like we in Nigeria, I saw it as a, maybe we have business ideas. And because we have it, we travel over many countries then to, to introduce our life business, our talent. I think retailer, if I we see it, they should not be, do it as a jealousy. When somebody is progressing, it's God who progresses somebody. Then some people are raised. Even when you call them to come and do the business, they can't do it. They added, they have enjoyed a peaceful accommodation and business environment in Kofodia and explained some Ghanaian youth learned retail trading from them. For them, a peaceful coexistence in retail trade will strengthen the African bond and oneness. And most of them, the guys here, we opened their eyes. When I came to here at this before there seven years ago, you hardly see Ghana guys selling market on the street with a truck or even put on the ground. But we came here, we humbled ourselves, we are doing it. They, they learned from us and they, they picked with us, some of them. All right, so we're going to stay a while longer on this story. It's a developing story. I've been joined in the studio by Richard Amamu, uh, who is the Deputy General Secretary of the Ghana Union of Trade Association. Thank you very much, Richard, for your time, and good to have you uh, on the program. So you facilitated the opening of the shops at Oprah Square, but we know that Electrical Dealers Association of Ghana are still up in arms. They're quite uh, unexcited about what you have done. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, we had a discussion with the police as leadership and um, we all agreed that there is the need for us to open the shops for now to allow the Nigerians to go through the process and make sure they, uh, they exited or those who are capable of getting their documentations fine. For us we are not against them. Mm -hmm. What we are calling for is to uh, the government to see to it that the law is implemented to the latter. Mm. So if you want to come here and do business, you are welcome, but you must go through the process. But at a time when Ghana uh, pushed for the Secretariat of the African Continental of Free Trade uh, to be hosted, uh, and they have gotten it, we've gotten to host the Secretariat here in Ghana, uh, doesn't this fly in the face? I don't think the African Free Trade, uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement, or the Secretariat here, is coming to throw away our investment laws. I don't think that that is coming of to course, hinder. The, the, the yeah, airport's protocols allow for free movement of goods and services as well as people, and that is what we want to, uh, you know, to to push as ECOWAS to allow yes, for. Yes, the ECOWAS pro protocol is still in the system, mm. which allows ninety days. And you don't think that's uh, ninety uh, days? You don't think the GIPC law it contravenes the? Not Air at Force? all. Not at all. You are allowed to come if you want to reside and do business. Then you also go to another, go through another process. Mm. You see, if you want a resident permit, and then a, that is where you get your resident permit and a working permit. The ECOWAS allows us to move. Uh, within each country, uh, I mean, West African countries, within 90 days you go back, mm. do you see? So if after 90 days you decided not to go back, then of course that is where you will be found wanting. But again, the challenge here is that your mo members have taken to the street to forcefully push these people out of their shops. That is illegal as well. No, you can't say it is illegal. I don't think they close the shops themselves. They ask them to, the Nigerians, to close the, their shops themselves. Yeah, and because in the event that the Nigerians fail to do so, in, in they the, moved in the, and closed the, no, close the, their shops. The question is, we have citizen vigilantes in this, in this system. Do you understand me? Mm. Which, if I, if I see somebody flouting our laws, I have the right to make sure I can tell that thing. So our people, we keep on uh, engaging government. And uh, it's like government is not doing anything. And our people think that they are, uh, uh, it's, it's about their livelihood. They are losing their money, they are losing their business. And for that matter, they have to do something. And that is what they've decided to do. And I don't think they are doing it violently. They go to their shops and then tell them where you are, you are not supposed to be there. Close your shop. If you think you, cannot, you are not going to close, they say, okay, let's go to the police station and, and sort it out. And we've gone to the uh, police station. Kindly hold on for me. Uh, let me get on the phone lines and speak to Kwame Doné, who is the Secretary General of the International Chamber of Commerce and also the Managing Director of the World Trade Center, Ghana. Thank you, Mr. Doné, for your time. So uh, what do you make of the ongoing feud between Guta and the other foreign retailers, which appears intractable? Um, 
I would just say that uh, it, it's more to do with your, your laws. Um, if, if the law is quite clear and explicit on on who does petty trading, we, we just have to enforce it. But the international best practice on false localization, it's quite clear that uh, it has its own negative repercussions on both the investor and on the host country on issues of competitiveness and, uh, and attractiveness as an investment destination. But going forward, um, uh, I believe once we'll be hosting the Secretariat for the AFC, FDA, um, work should be done towards an eventual uh, multilateral framework on investment. We should be clear on the rules, investors, governments, and relevant stakeholders. Right. Uh, so essentially, you are calling for a harmonization of, of, of all the trade laws within the uh, continent. There are also some calling for the GIPC law to be amended to reflect the larger ECOWAS Treaty, which allows for free movement of uh, goods and services as well as people. What do you think? An, an investment promotion and protection regime only makes sense if it is high standard in terms of its coverage, definition, uh, maybe scope of protection and other market opening provisions, you know. And uh, you should also have a strong dispute settlement provisions in, in, in your laws so that uh, once uh, a person sees himself as an investor and uh, he tends to uh, tends in a genuine way, there are avenues for dispute settlement, yeah. I mentioned earlier, Mr. Donay, that this feud is becoming intractable. Uh, is it about time the executive steps in to bring some sanity? We haven't heard from him. Um, it's up to the authorities. I, I believe uh, the association itself uh, needs to cool down. Uh, our, neighbors, uh, uh, our neighbors have always been with us. And uh, growing up, I remember some industries were even seen as a preserve of some, com of some countries. I remember those days, uh, most of the filling stations we had in our villages were being run by uh, foreigners, you know, but nobody complained. Along the line, Ghanaians did gain expertise in, in that department. Now we have uh, Ghanaians owning filling stations all over. Um, you also have uh, people involved in petty trading, and they might not even have a shop, you know, they might be selling uh, city material, they might not be Ghanaians, but how, how do you deal with that? So we need to address it holistically, you know, that uh, we've, we've been with people and uh, they've been doing this. And then the issue of ownership comes in, that if we, we want to look at our sovereignty and then Ghanaians want to own things, then we, we can draft rules that make it clear that uh, for you to set up over here, you need a Ghanaian partner so that at least Ghanaians can be part owners of their own economy. Yeah, going for it, yeah. Right, thank you very much. Uh, Kwame Doné is Secretary General of the International uh, Chamber of Commerce as well as the Managing Director of the World Trade Center here in Ghana. Uh, let me just quickly wrap up with uh, Richard Amamu, who's a Deputy General Secretary of Guta. So what's the way forward? What's the solution? Your members have threatened uh, to, to embark on a demonstration. The way forward is very, very simple. The law must be implemented to the latter. What we need is we have laws. I don't think... Other countries are relenting on their laws. We move to or we travel to other countries, we stick and we adhere to their laws. So when anybody that wants to come to country, uh, Ghana, if you want to come to Ghana to do business, you must learn and know what it all entails. So if our investment laws are saying that this is the way out, you must follow it and then, I mean, you can do business. and. You, you get your money and take it away. For right. us, we believe strongly that uh, we have laws in this country. Uh, if you want to go, to, if you get to Nigeria right now, as we speak, Nigeria has banned uh, importation of rice. Is anybody, has anybody taken them on? No, it's their, it's their free will to do that. So if we have uh, laws, investment laws in this country, we want the, the laws to be implemented to the latter and nothing else. 
All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Richard Amamu is the Deputy uh, General Secretary of the Ghana Union of Traders Association. You're still watching Media Life here on TV3. Now, to one of our top stories for the day, government spent $4.5 million on the senior national team, the Black Stars, at the just-ended Africa Cup of Nations tournament in Egypt. The sports minister, Isaac Isiama, who disclosed this in a statement on the floor of Parliament Wednesday, indicated the amount was out of the approved $6.3 million for the tournament. The sports ministry did not disclose the budget for the national soccer team, the Black Stars, prior to their departure. This led to speculations as to how much of the taxpayers' money was going to be spent at the tournament. There were calls for the budget to be made public, but that was not done, leading to members of parliament demanding a briefing. The sports minister, Isaac Isiama, told Parliament that a sum of $4.5 million was expended by the Black Stars who exited the AFCON at the round of 16 stage. Actual expenditure, Mr. Speaker, an amount of $4,564,352 was expended from the training tour to the time Ghana exited from the main tournament. He gave a breakdown of how the $4.5 million was expended. The expenditure covered playing body, members of parliament, thus the select committee on youth, sports and culture. FA, $924,168. Per diem for players, $187,050. Per diem for technical staff, $129,600. Per diem for additional technical staff, $90,750. Ranking member of the Select Committee on Youth, Sports and Culture, Kobla Mensa Woyumi, called for further details, insisting that putting an item such as members of parliament could be confusing. We want these figures at least uh, break down for us to then understand, you know, what went into those itemized uh, uh, line items. Those line items, about six of them, including the MPs. And the way it was couched, as if all members of the committee went... No, not all the members of the committee were there. In fact, you're looking at about uh, five or so or six. Other members of parliament argue that Coach Kwesi Apia should be maintained, though he was taxed to go and win the AFCON when he was appointed. I totally disagree on those who want to make that argument that will land us in getting a foreign coach. Four of the coaches that have won as caps in this country are Ghanaians. The majority leader of Seiche Mensa Bonsu asked the sports ministry to make a definite statement on the future of the Black Stars coach. The minister and indeed the outfit that is in charge of the Black Stars should come with a definitive pronouncement on the coach, not leave him in limbo. If it's to be continued, a decision will have to be taken and it will have to be made known to him. If he is to be discontinued, he must be told. He called for a relook at Colts football, where he believes is hunting ground for talent. When we're doing so well in the 60s and 70s, our academicals were very good. And most of the players at the time, the Yaosams, the Malik Jabels, all of them graduated from the academicals. Now, academicals is gone. And Colts football is gone. North Town MP Samuel Okujetua Blakwa questioned how the travel and tour agency White Oak, which flew the supporters, was awarded the contract. Was it a competitive tender process? The terms of the supporters, is it true that some are still there and some are stranded? The Honorable Minister himself, there was a video that went viral uh, encouraging supporters uh, to uh, go on uh, a sketching more or less. The sports minister reacting to the statement made by members of the House denied allegations that government sponsored supporters to Egypt to go on an excursion. I mean, that is neither here nor there. It was a decision by CAF and FIFA to organize all supporters in all the countries that participated for the excursion. So as a minister, I was briefed by the FA of Ghana and there was a communication I had with the, with the supporters. I had to communicate to the supporters. So that's all that happened. The sports minister said a detailed report on the tournament is to be provided by the Normalization Committee, after which major recommendations and decisions regarding 
the reorganization of football in Ghana would follow. Winners of the competition, Algeria walked away with a trophy and a sum of $4.5 million as prize money. Senegal, the silver medalist, won $2.5 million, while the semi-finalists took $2 million, with the quarter-finalists taking $1 million each. Right, and one other component that has really gotten a section of the public talking is the supporters' incentive. Well, if you're still wondering why it became so necessary, perhaps a youth and sports minister justified it in this way when he met the fans in Egypt. arrangements. <laughs> A bear said, Hank on a moshe, Nadia, Yaba, Egypt. Where civilization, Hana Shasi? Where civilization? If we are seeing any piano, Shabako Simbab Mahanade, Shasi. And the idea is documented. A history. Meanwhile, former sports minister Neil Ante van der Poy has questioned the AFCON 2019 budget, which was presented by Isaac Asiyama, the current minister for youth and sports. The sector minister appeared before parliament on Wednesday, 24 July 2019, to render an account of how the money allocated to the senior national team during the campaign was spent. The lawmaker expressed his views earlier on Thursday. Unfortunate, uh, disappointing. Um, let me say this, um, the minister did not do himself any good. Coming to parliament to tell us they spent 4.5 million out of 6.3 for the tournament where we got to one system stage. Uh, let me say this, um, it's obvious that a lot of questions needed to be asked. We need further probing of the by report he presented to parliament. Issues about accommodation, issues about medical, issues about visa. And the bonus. Is the minister telling us that uh, they paid $41,000 as bonus to each player? Because if you divide 965 by 23 players, uh, you're getting almost 41.4. I think it's, 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 uh, it beats imagination. It's, it doesn't make sense. And I think we need further clarification for the minister. He said they'll be giving a detail. I don't know what sort of details. Is the details going to be different from what he stated as winning bonus? If he does that, then the minister has not been truthful with parliament. He may have committed perjury for, before parliament because he, uh, he may have lied to parliament. This is the worst we've ever seen in our history. Even Brazil was better. Right, so we're going to be doing some more analysis on this story. It's a very developing story. So just to give you a, a brief background of exactly uh, the expenditure and all that's happened uh, throughout the tournament, we'll start off uh, with the budget analysis for the AFCON 2019. And, and for CAF in itself, the Confederation of African Football spent a th total of $14.2 million, which is budgeted for the last eight teams. That's like eight, the last eight teams. Uh, now, each of them uh, was supposed to get uh, $800,000, making a total of $3.2 million. Now, for the fourth and third teams, each was supposed to get uh, $2 million each. The second team was supposed to get $2.5 million. And the eventual winner, which is Algeria, uh, was supposed to go home with $4.5 million. We've also got some analysis of what other countries uh, within the region spent as their allocation for the tournament. The Algeria, the uh, eventual winners, um, you know, allocated or budgeted an amount of $4.5 million. That's exactly equal to the amount that they, they got uh, from winning the tournament. Now, Senegal uh, allocated $5.1 million, Nigeria $6 million, Ivory Coast $7.1 million, Madagascar $1.6 million. Uh, we have that for Zimbabwe uh, making $4 million, uh, Namibia, Uganda, Kenya, and Angola. It would seem that Angola and Madagascar, uh, together with Namibia, budgeted the least and Namibia budgeted the, the very least of all with $1.3 million. The highest uh, in the tournament was um, the Ivory Coast. Uh, they budgeted $7.1 million. Now, the eventual winners, which is Algeria, uh, had allocated an amount of $4.5 million, which is uh, equal to the amount that they, they, they got, you know, after winning the tournament. So you can do your own calculations there. Uh, we're going to come back to this, but quickly, um, 
we've been joined in studio by Yao Ofosulabi, who was our man on the ground who covered the AFCON tournament in Egypt. Uh, he returned uh, a few days ago. Yao, good yeah. to have you back in the studio. How was Egypt? Uh, it was good. Great. It was, it was great. Great. So, you know, lots of issues have come out of Egypt. I'm sure you've, you've been monitoring the discussions yourself. <laughs> we're told, for instance, that there were journalists who received per diem uh, together with supporters. How true is this? Well, well that's, that's actually true. I mean, there were journalists that... Uh, there were journalists that who uh, that were uh, were sponsored by the ministry to go to Egypt to cover the African Cup of Nations, and so they were mm -hmm. paid per diem mm -hmm. um, in in you know together with the supporters. Is there anything to, wrong with that? With What's been the practice over the years? Um, it, it has never been done before. I mean, a lot of the journalists who were there actually mentioned that it's, it's something that has never been done, and so. Um, this is, the, this is the first time something like that has been done. This is the first time the ministry is sponsoring journalists. Yes, that's 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 what that's what I heard from, you know, the the journalists who have covered Afcon for for a really long time. You know, there are journalists who have who have covered ten, five Afcons and and stuff like that. And so that's what I gathered from them. But for supporters, yes, they were also paid per diems, and then um, they were given places to sleep and all of that. But the the sports minister denied the fact that supporters uh, were budgeted for. But we've heard that mm. supporters who were s sponsored mm -hmm. to go watch the tournament in Egypt, you know, ha were also taking some uh, pay diems and monies as well. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's what I just mentioned. That, okay. I mean, supporters uh, were, were, were paid per diems for their So how do you find the minister's denial? Um, I, I have I have no idea. I, I don't know. I don't know why he would deny it. But I mean, the supporters, if you know, you ask them, will give you a clear indication of what happened in, in, in Egypt. The, there are arguments also about our budget for the AFCON 2019. Yeah. Is this our biggest budget yet for AFCON? Um, I don't. I don't think this is our biggest budget yet. But but I think that um, the amount of money spent mm. within the time that we we stayed in the competition is where is where the problem lies. Mm. I mean that only uh, uh, throws in the question that what would have happened if we had we had we had gone to the final. But come on, oh, yeah, exactly. we've just done an analysis and, of and, other, and, and, other countries. And that's what I'm to saying. To be fair, that's, Ghana, that's what I'm saying. The Ghana. thing is, the thing is, that's the budget you've seen. Mm. They, they, you, you don't you don't know how much they spent. Right, and, 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 and to be and so to be fair to our, 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 uh, those watching us, what we gave you were just allocations. Exactly. You know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that all that money was expended. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so, and so, for instance, this morning, uh, this morning we are, we are hearing from the Ugandan FA that uh, they spent in excess of, of one million dollars. That's how much they spent out of that six million that was budgeted. They also made it to the. They, all, they also made it to the round, the round of right. uh, the round of sixteen. Mm -hmm. And so, and so that's what I'm saying that. But Nigeria they, they, budgeted they could, about six. Nigeria budgeted six million, mm -hmm. and they, they stayed up until the end of the competition right. because they played in the right. in the third and the fourth Ivory games. Coast and as well. The Ivory Coast left in the quarterfinal stage right. because mm -hmm. they were beaten by Algeria, and so. Mm -hmm. um, we need to we need to weigh properly because it, we, we it depends have a full on facts, exactly you know, on, on ours. We budgeted about six million, six point three million, and we spent about and four, we spent four point five million. Give us some credit. We saved some money for the country. <laughs> but I, I mean, I, that's what I'm saying that for 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 the for the for the for the duration that we stayed in the competition and the amount of money, it's a bit ridiculous. Especially you find it for, ridiculous. Yeah, I, I find it ridiculous. Why? Especially Why? for especially for how much was spent on accommodation, for instance. Mm. Um CAF provides accommodation for forty members of, of every country that that that, that makes uh, the African Cup of Nations. And so if there are forty members of every country who an allocation is made for, the players are twenty three, the technical staff are about ten, and then let, let's let's make way for other members who could have joined the team. That 40 should be allocated for. And so if if there are 40 members that are allocated for and then we still come out with um, a fee for accommodation that goes in excess of $1 million, that's a problem, don't you think? Don't you think it's a problem? You it think, is a problem, You think actually. we require some further and better particulars? I think that... I, a, I, a lot I, more breakdown. Yeah, I think that a lot more breakdown. A lot more breakdown. And who's going to answer these questions? The minister himself. I mean, I, I think that he... Uh, is at the heart of everything. He is the man who uh, over, oversaw everything that happened in Egypt. He was in Egypt uh, during the entire duration of the African Cup of Nations. He has um, the information that most of us do not have. And so he has to come out and give us those further and better facts. I find it rather curious that, you know, some years back, many years back, or mm. a few years back, the minister, who mm. was then in a position, was quite vociferous when it came to the Black Stars and issues about expenditure and all that. Yeah. Don't you find it curious yourself? Well, I, I, I don't find it curious, mm -hmm. um, um, 
Park is here. I think that that's that's the way it has gone in this mm. country. I mean, if you're if you're on the other side, you have something else to say. And we've had Lee Lato, who was a former sports minister, say this is the worst ever. <laughs> like seriously, I mean, is it the worst ever? I, I think that the, the country oversaw its mm. worst ever football campaign under his administration mm. as well, and so mm. um, he can't describe this as the worst ever. Mm. I mean, Brazil is is is, is it's still still, fresh, is still fresh in our minds. Mm. It's still the country's greatest law when mm. it comes to football. Mm. But, so, but it doesn't so, mean that we're not. These figures. Oh, we will scrutinize these figures. What do you intend to do as, as um, know, the, the, sportsmen? What, what what we intend to do is to to keep asking questions, to mm. keep uh, to keep probing where did the monies go, where uh, are the rest of the supporters who who were left in Egypt? Is it true that there are some supporters? There, there are still supporters. Why are they there? There, there are still supporters There's in no Egypt. There's no money to bring them back the, home. It's not about it's not it's not an issue about money. I think that is an issue about um, uh, air tickets and airfares and how they were allocated. Mm. Now, when they were brought into Egypt, the idea was that the black stars would go far in a competition just because of how well we've done in the past six Afghans. Mm -hmm. And so um, most of them had their return dates after the final. Now, if it's after the final, that means there's, there's going to be a congestion uh, for, for the flights th that come into Egypt. That's Egypt Air and, and the Ethiopian Airlines. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of them could not make uh, the time between 20th to the 25th. And so most of them, uh, some of them actually have their return dates for the 4th of August and the 2nd of August. Mm -hmm. And so they would have to stay and come at that uh, time. I but but, but it, it is untrue that they are stranded. They are, they are not stranded, stranded at all. Mm -hmm. They I have places to sleep and they are just yeah. waiting for their return dates mm -hmm. to return. I thought this was going to be my final question, but on the issue of a Accommodation. What we've had, um, what I've heard this morning, is that a lot of the accommodation expenditure was in Dubai. Is that not justifiable enough? Um, well, I think that then that would be justifiable. I think you see that the the, the other issue is that a lot of a lot of this uh, uh, talk has left out the campaign in Dubai. I think that it's inclusive mm. of whatever happened at Afcon 2019. The the campaign was part of of, of what happened. Now, and so the accommodation there. It's something that the, the government had to incur because it was camping. It wasn't under CAF's mm. jurisdiction, mm. and so uh, the government had to uh, but, swallow that. But all swallow the other teams also went on camping. But all the other teams also went on camping mm. as well. And so, I mean, the, the company in Dubai mm. uh, also has to has a lot to, to say about Perfect. how um, the, the 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 budget has has skyrocketed and the right. amounts that we are seeing at the moment. Right. But but yes, supporters were taken. Yes, supporters lived in you know different hotels. Media men, in, were, were media were, men, media. Men were, were taken there as well and paid. Um, they were also put in, in hotels as well. And so, um, you know, these are all issues that uh, have to be uh, spoken about in, in addition to uh, the other things that we do not know about where, what happened in the budget, especially uh, there's, 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 an, there's a part of the budget that says incidentals. We do not know what, what, what those incidentals are. I think that they need to come in. And, and, all right, and, thank and you very much, Ofo Sulabi. Uh, what's a man on the ground in Egypt? He covered everything and he's come back to give us a briefing on exactly what happened. There's something interesting also that happened um, on Tilapia. You've got to watch that. So, uh, as you can see there, the cut, uh, uh, you can see a taxpayer, and I think that should be my colleague George, who's watching his television set, his black and white television set at home, and he's, you know, trusting that Ghana will bring the cup back home. And then just uh, at the side, we've got, um, I guess, officials of the GFA, uh, yes, officials of the uh, Football Association, as well as the minister, um, you know, together with additional technical staff, the technical staff, you know, <laughs> with the budgets, and which includes the per diem and winning bonus. Uh, something for the laughs. All right, you still watch Amid Life here on TV3. If you feel strongly about any of our stories this afternoon, or if you've got any views to share at all on the Black Stars, uh, you can feel free to send them on any of our social media pages on Facebook and on Twitter. It's TV3GH. Now, on our MTN video report today, our citizen journalist Mubarak Usman Mukhtari reports on a road at Donye in the Upper West region, which has been taken over by flood waters. This road leads to the suburb, a section of Donia, which is called Tuduri. And some of the students pass through this same road. And the people there count for a healthcare facility at, uh, using this same road. And this road leads to uh, a number of communities like Yonuru, Gurumu, Metel, Jagalo, and the rest. 
but here it is we don't know when that uh, this uh, water is going to drain so that people can use it as we can see people are standing uh, willing to use this same road but unfortunately I don't think they'll be able to use this road for today so we are we are calling on the government to come and help us maybe with the work that was done last month so that maybe probably more money should be financed on this uh, kind of project my name is Mubarak Mokhtare I'm reporting from Donia Just like Mubarak, you can also send in your video reports on 055-143304 for the 055-143304. Still ahead, we have the very latest in business news. We've got sports news and international news. All right, let's do some business news now. And President Kufado has cut this, has cut sword for the construction of the second phase of a 21 uh, meter square uh, towel factory at uh, Kedagana Ceramics uh, Company Limited at Echaban in the Shama district of the Western Region as an expression of the one district one factory policy. The first phase, commissioned by the president 18 months ago, has been producing uh, over 14 meter square of towels annually. The $7.7 .7 million Chinese investment by the Sanda Group will provide over 5,000 direct and indirect jobs to the country's youth, especially within the operational area of the company. Over 70% of produce will be sold in the country and in the sub-region. Commissioning the factory, President Ikufado applauded the Sanda Group for the initiative and encouraged them to capitalize on the good investment climate to do more. He said it was refreshing to note that the factory has helped the country reduce the importation of towels by 14%. He stressed that the reduction is significant as it will affect the country's import bill positively. The president said last year the country's import bill stood at $12 billion, adding that 30% of the top companies responsible for 56% of the figures import things Ghana can do. Why are we insistent on the One District, One Factory initiative? First of all, we have to change the nature of our economy. We cannot continue to be producers and exporters of raw materials if we want to bring progress and prosperity to our country. We have to enter the 21st century as an industrial value-adding economy. And that's exactly what is taking place here in Shama under the ages of this company. The Minister of Trade and Industry, Alan Chiramati, said Keda Ceramics is one of the best testimonies of the viability of the concept of the 1D1F. There could be no better testimony than what we are seeing here this afternoon of the validity of the concept of one district, one factory. Can we imagine if all the districts in Ghana had something of this similar nature being built around the country? Ghana will become a different place. And that is what the one district, one factory speaks about. Chinese Ambassador Shi Ting Wang said Keda Ceramics Factory strongly backs the 1D1F initiative proposed by the government. This is a wonderful example of my support, the China support to Ghana Beyond Aid. So this is the answer. Uh, this is a model, a model of success of Ghana Beyond Aid. In other news, bond savings and loans recorded over 2 million CDs as income from lending activities in 2018 as against a little over 1 million CDs recorded in 2017. The chief executive officer of the company, George Ofosuhini, acknowledged payroll lending as one of the safest means of lending, adding they will expand the venture through technology and also change the market perception of payroll lending. George Quenin has more. This is the second time bond savings and loans has taken their turn as far as the Ghana Stock Exchange facts behind the figures is concerned. 
the company in 2017 embarked on a venture to raise funds from the Ghana First Income Market with three main objectives, which included the expansion of its loan book, enhancing liquidity management, as well as fund IT and brand infrastructure. So far, 70 million CDs has been issued out of the 100 million CDs shelf amount. Coupon payments, on the other hand, were successfully earned promptly on the due date without failure. According to CEO of Bond Savings and Loans, they are ready for Bank of Ghana's cleanup exercise in the savings and loans sector. We have been ready since last year. We have absolutely no problem at all as far as this cleanup is concerned. We consider this to be one of the things that is necessary. If you look at um, what has happened over the period, there's absolutely no problem with that at all. But we don't have any of the issues relating to what is expected. When you, you hear this cleanup that is going on. One of the things that I tell people is that there isn't any institution that didn't know what was going to happen as far as you know its operations is concerned. 38 companies have listed on the stock exchange. This deputy managing director of GSE says would be increased with constant educational awareness on how the stock market operates. And to improve liquidity, two things have to happen. We have 38 companies listed now. That is not enough. We need to increase them as quickly as possible to maybe 50 and over. We need to get more companies to list in terms of floating shares so we can have um, a more equities on the market. Then investors who want to buy and sell equities will have the opportunity to buy and sell more of, uh, shares in different types of companies. Meanwhile, modalities for the expansion of shelf amounts to 400 million CDs has commenced. Well, that's all for the very latest in business news. For more business stories, you can log on to our website, www.3news.com. Now, away from business, uh, Ghana is among countries where the prevalence of chronic hepatitis B and C infections are high. According to the Ghana Health Service, between 2014 and 2018, a total of uh, 117,905 cases of viral hepatitis were recorded out of which 421 died. Ghana today joins the rest of the world to mark World Hepatitis Day with a call for renewed efforts in the prevention of viral hepatitis. Right, so as we join the rest of the world to celebrate the day, uh, I've been joined in the studio by Alfred Yanfo uh, Hinkra uh, from the Healthy River Foundation, Ghana. Uh, he's been researching into hepatitis and joins us in the studio. Uh, Alfred, thank you very much for your time. So, how worrying is hepatitis here in Ghana? Thank you too for having us. Um, it is so worrying to the extent that the prevalence rate is 8%. That is for hepatitis B. And then about hepatitis C, that is between 5 to 10%. And then from the statement that was issued, you could see that these are cases that was reported at the hospital. Because within a space of three months, I can count about eight of my clients who have developed complications and have passed away. So just look at the remote part of Ghana. I remember we traveled to the northern region. And the people there, they haven't even heard about hepatitis before. So you can imagine that this is what was reported in the hospital. What causes it? It's a viral infection. You know, we have hepatitis, we have alcohol-induced alcohol hepatitis, but the most common one, which is causing a lot of liver damage, is viral hepatitis. And, and, and how do them, people know if they got a B or a C? Okay, so we have the several types of the viruses. We have the A, B, C, D, and E. And, but the most common ones are the B and then the C. And with the B, the B and the C averagely affect almost about 325 million people worldwide. And it causes about 1.4 million deaths every year. So you could see that before one will know that I have hepatitis B or C, then that means you are doing a specific test for the B and then for the C. Mm. Then you, you quickly, know you quickly, have. quickly in 30 seconds. So what strides have we made here in Ghana? A, a lot hasn't been done. In fact, our, our health authorities are not paying so much attention to viral hepatitis because you realize that even the caregivers, the nurses and the doctors, a lot of them don't even have adequate knowledge on even how to care for the client. And then in terms of education, the education too is also less. Unlike for HIV, you visit every hospital, we have centers. But now, as we are speaking, more people are living with hepatitis B more than, than HIV. HIV AIDS. Thank you very much, Alfred. I'm sure we'll bring you back into the studio uh, to do some more on this uh, pretty much interesting topic. You're still watching Media Life here on TV3. We'll take a short break and Right, so Ace actress Nanama McBrown on Wednesday led a group of Kumewood actors to 
petition parliament to ensure that the film village promised by the government is built in Kumasi, the hub of Ghanaian movies and not in Chebi in the eastern region. While presenting the petition to the majority leader, Osechi Mensa Bonsu, the group averred that be beyond creating employment for thousands, uh, Kumewood has impacted the socio-economic well-being of many Ghanaians, hence the need to build the film village in Kumasi. All right, joining me to do a, a little discussion on this issue is entertainment critic Ola Michael. Uh, he's in the studio. Uh, Ola, thank you very much for your time. So you, I know you've been quite, you know, you've been, you've been following this issue uh, quite keenly. Is a film village the single most important need of the movie industry today? Not a single most important need, but it's one of the most important things that will boost the industry and also um, bring in a lot of commerce in terms of um, tourism and then the production itself. Mm -hmm. But um, because the 2019 budget highlighted in, in page um, six, uh, um, paragraph six and um, 630, that in 2019, government will pursue the passing of a legislative bill. Let me jump to the relevant points. The government has secured with the support of the traditional authorities, 200 acres of land at Bunsu Junction for the construction of an international movie village for the Ghana film industry. So that is why we petitioned the... And does it appear to you that government is reneging on this promise? It is not about them reneging, it's about the, where they want to site the village. And we are saying that... We've got Chebi yes. and then the Kumawood people are saying, let's... let's it's not just the Kumawood people. Yesterday, those of us who went to parliament had representations from Upper East, Upper West, and the Northern region, and Brown Half, and some from Central region, and then the Ashanti region. Mm. All these people agreed to the fact that if we want to have a place for film village, it should be in the Ashanti mm. region. More to that, um, there's a chief in the Ashanti region, um, Kunsu, I think that's the name, who has also donated 250 acres of land for the film village, if indeed government is you know, serious about doing it. Mm. And there's another chief at Himan who has also um, donated 150 acres already. So it means that everything to you know have it set up in Kumasi is there. Do we so know we don't understand consulted? why it has to go to. Do you know what sort of extensive uh, consultation government uh, did in deciding to you know cite it in in, in Chebi? You see irrespective of how many or whoever they consulted i think that the history we have in the industry you know detects that look ashanti region has got the history for filmmaking it's a hub it's the hub for the mm. filmmaking industry mm. in ghana mm. every actor that you know in ghana might have had a stake in ashanti region mm. you understand mm. that is why even and people from that's why that, that's what justifies that is what justified yes and the location is good mm. the commercially is good and the history too is there right. and the cultural balance of the ashanti region also helps well, it thank you ola michael is an entertainment critic thanks very much for joining us in studio for that discussion and thank you also for watching midday life here on tv3 for more news you can log on to our website www.3news.com my name is pa kwesi asai Thank you.